Hi, I'm Kelly Kramer. And I'm Scott Sipker. Welcome to our seventh season on Iowa Public Television. And a brand new edition of Iowa Outdoors. Coming up on Iowa Outdoors. We climb the windy turbines of central Iowa. Paddle past the spring migration at Sweet Marsh. Follow the journey of Iowa pollinating efforts. Discover the many trails within our state's border. And explore a trail in a minute. We'll have all that and more. So sit tight, Iowa Outdoors is about to begin. Funding for Iowa Outdoors is provided by the Claude P. Small, Catherine Small Cousins, and William Carl Cousins Fund at the Lincoln Way Community Foundation in Clinton County to support nature programming on Iowa Public Television. And by the Alliant Energy Foundation. Many of Iowa's natural wonders you'll find on Iowa Public Television can be found in Iowa Outdoors Magazine, the Iowa DNR's premier resource for conservation, education, and recreation activities. Subscription information can be found online at iowadnr.gov. Welcome to our seventh season of Iowa Outdoors. It's a journey that will take us across the state, covering everything from hiking and biking to water trails and photography. But first, we'll lift Iowans up into the windy skies for an adventure few realize is possible. In the renewable energy community, the northwest quadrant of Iowa is affectionately called the Saudi Arabia of wind. Few places in America rival the combination of wind speed and frequency as the open plains and rolling hills of Iowa. While there are thousands of wind turbines in place across the state, few Iowans ever have the opportunity to climb one. In Greene County, a small wind farm temporarily shut down a turbine to help us show you Iowa from above. Wind turbines. For millenniums, these elegant tools were used across the planet to grind grain and pump water. Today, they've become a ubiquitous staple of the Iowa landscape and a symbol of the state's potential for great power generation. Over the last 30 years, innovation in wind power production has pushed the once expensive technology east from its primary home in California to the untapped treasure trove of wind right here in Iowa. So it was about 1998 was the first uh, uh, utility-owned wind farm, and that was composed of three wind turbines by Algona, Iowa. And then in 1999, 250 megawatts of wind turbines were installed near Storm Lake, Iowa, and also near Clear Lake, Iowa. With thousands of turbines now scattered across the state, wind power generates more than one-third of Iowa's energy needs. And surprisingly, that power generation is not due to Iowa's heavy power consumption or our great need for an alternative fuel source, but simply location. I've always said that Iowa is in a sweet spot. We have good wind resources here, like we have here today, uh, but it's really not as windy here as it is in North Dakota and South Dakota and Nebraska. If you go to Illinois, or Indiana, they have a lot more people, a lot more need for electricity, but it's not as windy. It makes more sense to put the wind turbines here where they can be tied into the high voltage grid and deliver the power to the people. And some of the wind power that's generated in Iowa actually goes into other states. One of the greatest beneficiaries of the rise in wind power has been farmers. While it took some time for them to warm to the prospect of erecting massive towers in their fields, the incentive to do so made the turbines attractive real quick. Well, we had mixed motions, and when they come with it, we met with a lawyer in Jefferson. And uh, when you figure out cost per acre that you're getting for it, it's a pretty nice check every year. On average, the wind turbines in Iowa, such as the one on Max's property, require between a third and a half of an acre to erect the tower and a car path for easy access. However, leasing the land was not an issue for Max, considering all the benefits the turbine provides. They're good for everything, you know, along with the farmer getting paid. And I think the less we can depend on other people and do our own su supply of electricity, the better off we are. Including the Junction Hilltop Wind Farm, 
Greene County is home to nearly 30 wind turbines, with plans in the coming years to bump that number closer to 70. That may seem like a lot, but only a drop in the bucket compared to the nearly 4,000 turbines dotting the Iowa countryside. I think what everybody has learned here is that if you put wind turbines out in areas where there just aren't very many people, then, you know, it really doesn't bother anybody. The income that they produce for the landowners and, and the community and property taxes and all that, people think that's a reasonable trade-off and they think that's fair. But more than dollars and cents, these skyscraping power cells offer something previously unattainable to many of these areas, a chance to climb to the skies and see their world firsthand from above. Okay, so have you ever uh, put on a climbing harness before? Uh, it's been a very long time, so assume I don't know. Well, that was a yes. In theory, climbing a wind turbine is no different than climbing a rock wall or building. To make sure you're safe at all times, technicians and turbine visitors are required to wear a full body harness, gloves, and glasses. You feel comfortable? If seeing all these precautions gives you pause, know that the crew overseeing today's climb have been extensively trained in wind turbine safety and helping those interested in making their own ascent. Uh, it's very safe to climb a wind turbine. Uh, we have uh, very extensive uh, safety training that we provide all of our employees uh, long before they're ever allowed to enter a wind turbine. Uh, the wind turbine itself has a lot of uh, integrated uh, safety equipment that ensures People are not exposed to fall hazards or electrical hazards in their normal course of uh, action in, inside the machine. Chief among those safety measures is a practice known as 100% tie-off, where climbing cable latches and twin-tailed fall arrest lanyards are used to connect climbers to the tower at all times. But the number one factor in determining if a climb is possible is weather. Your wind speed limits are 53 miles an hour, so beyond that we don't allow access into the machine. You need to have no ice presence so that there's not uh, a risk of falling ice for personal injury or damaging equipment, things like that. With acceptable wind speeds and no ice present, it's time to climb. I'm going, here we go. Inside of the Junction Hilltop Towers is a technical console, a staging area, and of course, the 260-foot ladder. And the only way to reach the top is climb. However, before I could start my ascent, Nick and his crew made sure to go over best climbing practices and review each piece of safety equipment one more time. All right, so this is happening, huh? All right, here we go. Climbing nearly the length of a football field into the sky is no easy task. Thankfully, the towers have three platforms that allow for climbers to rest, as well as a port to watch other climbers scale the ladder. At this point, you may be wondering who exactly is allowed to climb a wind turbine. Well, the answer may surprise you. People that have the privilege of working in the wind energy industry or owning uh, wind energy uh, facilities uh, have the opportunity to climb wind turbines. And beyond that, friends and family can join wind turbine owners for a climb when a turbine is shut down for routine maintenance. For instance, Junction Hilltop has invited Greene County residents, senior citizens, and college students to scale its towers. Tom Wind, who has climbed many towers throughout his career, still sees wind turbines as an inspiring feat of engineering, as well as a gift to society. It still amazes me when I'm near a wind turbine that those blades traveling through the air can extract so much power. No fuel is used. You don't have to write a check for to an oil company or to a coal company. It's helpful to the environment and uh, it's good for everybody around. The full effect of Tom's thoughts are easily felt once you climb into the nacelle or engine room at the top of the turbine. With just a few final steps out onto the roof, the scale of the blades is incredible and the experience unparalleled. As breathtaking as it was, the wind had picked up by the time we reached the top, so the crew asked us not to stand up. However, if you luck into the right weather, with all the safety tie-offs available, you can literally stand on top of the world.
Once you've had your fill of life on top of a turban, all that's left is the climb down. While much easier than climbing up, the visual can potentially induce vertigo. So if you have the opportunity to ascend a turban, remember, there's no escaping the descent. Everyone may not get the chance to climb all the way to the top and see out of a wind turbine, but hopefully this gives you a little bit of an idea of how incredible it is up there and all of the great renewable energy we have right here in Iowa. Iowa's waterways can alter dramatically as the seasons change. Spring rains or summer dry spells can make a river or lake ideal for fishing or paddling. Or fluctuating water levels can ruin the experience entirely. In early to mid-spring, one northeast Iowa marsh inhabits that ideal aquatic habitat. Spring rain and early vegetation combine for a unique paddling experience. And one outfitter is bringing Iowans along for the journey at northeast Iowa's Sweet Marsh. The sights and sounds of early spring are unmistakable in Northeast Iowa. The Sweet Marsh Wildlife Management Area in Brimmer County is likely a spot you've never thought to explore, but it's a destination for paddlers and wildlife, drifting and flying through the cattails and shallow waterways of this Iowa wetland. Do not leave things in the pockets. They may not be found for a very long time. Novice and experienced paddlers alike are descending on this quaint corner of Iowa marshland following the lead of some experienced Iowa outdoorsmen. And uh, we have a variety of different kayaks for you to get into tonight. We have a few that are asked for specific boats. Uh, but a couple things I want to point out real quick with the paddle, that when you're paddling, um, to make the boat go forward, you're going to be going like this. Okay, to go backwards, you're going to push forward with the paddle. Darren Siefkin, a former county conservation officer, now owns nearby outfitter Crawdaddy Outdoors. His passion for the simplicities of an early spring paddle have migrated to his customers. Go ahead and have a seat. Leave your foot out. Yep. How's that? All right. Each spring, Darren and his outfitter team invite the public to join in on the adventure, renting a guided kayak trip for Iowans of varying age and experience. And this boat's uh, very turny. So it's not you, so. Well, through the store and our marsh migrations floats, it's been 10 years, uh, but I've been here in Bremer County for over 25 years and been enjoying Sweet Marsh for all those years, whether it be kayaking or canoeing or biking or hiking out here. We go down the channel here at Sweet Marsh where it's usually fairly protected from the wind, and then we uh, basically head out into the open area. Then we have a couple different passageways that over the years we've kind of been using and they've kind of expanded a little bit to where um, only kayaks and canoes can make it through those spots. The lowland topography of Sweet Marsh stands out on an Iowa landscape covered with tiled and terraced farmland. Its isolation makes the marsh a migratory bird oasis. It's one of the larger marshes and wetland areas in northeast Iowa, and uh, it's one of the top ten bird watching spots in the state. And a lot of that has to do with a lot of the different kinds of habitats, whether it be the wetlands, prairies, woodlands, streams, rivers that come through uh, Sweet Marsh. But a lot of habitats bring a lot of different bird species in. You got the, the shallow water, you got the deeper water, we got mud flats, so we've got all kinds of birds and, and other wildlife that comes through here. So I never know what I'm going to see when I come out here to shoot photos. Kip Ladegi's back here in the camouflage. He's uh, always helping us out on these marsh migration trips. He's uh, from Tripola, a local wildlife photographer, uh, spends a lot of time here at the marsh, probably more than anyone else out here at the marsh. Um, I call it my nature fix. I gotta have a nature fix every day. Kip Ladegi spends plenty of quality time in this same wetland each April and May, quietly drifting through narrow passageways with his camera gear in tow. When I get off of work, or sometimes before I go to work, you never know when the, what the prescription says. If the weather is good, um, I want to get out, and it's just it's how I get away. It's my relaxation. The refuge of Sweet Marsh, surrounded by miles of open farm fields, creates a valuable destination for a long list of migratory wildlife. Herons, pelicans, trumpeter swans, sandhill cranes, and eagles can be seen each year at Sweet Marsh. It creates an opportunity that photographers like Kip can't afford to pass up. 
We never know what we're going to see for birds. Uh, the early in the year is a waterfowl. We just never know what we're going to see. Sometimes the species will stay for weeks. Sometimes they're here and gone. It's just a, it's a gamble, but it, we've never get skunked. There's always something to see. Kip's images are just a snapshot of the Sweet Marsh experience. Paddlers may see a different migratory bird each week during the spring, and conditions on the water are constantly evolving. The time window for paddling in Sweet Marsh is relatively short. Its location in northeast Iowa is heavily managed by conservation officials. More than 3,000 acres of the space is open for hunting, while 200 acres are set aside as a wildlife refuge. Water levels begin to drop by the end of May as wildlife personnel prepare the land for food plantings. Those new food plots encourage migratory birds to return to Sweet Marsh later in the fall as the water levels increase prior to hunting season in November. The constantly changing water depths also makes for a unique paddling experience. Vegetation and water pools create new and different passageways through the marsh each year, giving even longtime visitors a reason to keep coming back. For these Iowa adventurers, the first signs of spring mark a new outdoor chapter, a chance to experience sweet marsh for the first or 20th time. It's fun to see the excitement in new paddlers' faces, or even even experienced paddlers when they see the sandhill cranes dancing in front of them, or, or who knows what, what we're going to see, but it's, it's really exciting to see that. Populations of pollinators, like bees and butterflies, are declining, and that could spell trouble for our ecosystem and food supply. Several Iowa organizations are determined to reverse the trend and hope to get you involved. Native pollinators are very important to humans and every animal in our ecosystem. One third of our global food supply is directly related to pollination. But a variety of pollinating insects, like bees and butterflies, are disappearing at alarming rates. Many things are happening, happening to pollinators. Um, things like global climate change, disease, some modern agricultural and landscaping practices. Um, but most of all, loss of habitat, loss of nectar sources, which is their food resource, and host plants, which is how they can reproduce. Milkweed is the host plant for monarch butterflies. It's the only plant in which they can lay their eggs. And milkweed is the only plant their caterpillars can eat. Monarchs have an iconic migration pattern. They winter in Mexico, and they move up through the central United States generation by generation over the spring and summer until a super butterfly is born that flies all the way from the upper Midwest back to Mexico. So you can imagine in all those different landscapes, there's lots of different stressors that the monarchs' populations are facing. How to establish those conservation practices that can increase habitat in underutilized areas in rural landscapes. So we can grow corn and soybeans and cows and pigs and we can grow monarchs at the same time and trying to find that sweet spot. A small backyard garden, even a pot, can be like a gas station for these insects to stop as they travel between larger swaths of appropriate habitat. So Blank Park Zoo created the Plant, Grow, Fly program to encourage planting specialized butterfly gardens of any size, anywhere. Our plant list are plants that you can easily find in a greenhouse, that will thrive in a backyard garden, that are relatively inexpensive, um, and will look nice because people aren't as used to seeing native gardens as they are used to seeing those exotic plants that we traditionally use in landscaping. Um, but the good thing is, is they can look beautiful, um, you can make them look manicured, or you can make them look more wild, and they're going to require a lot less maintenance. The prairie system at Neil Smith Wildlife Refuge wouldn't be able to survive and reproduce without pollinators. Last year, the refuge grew 40,000 native plants in its greenhouse to help give Iowans a jump start on planting large gardens and patches of prairie through its People for Pollinators program. We just try to get as much diversity of plants as we can. We try to get plants that bloom through the seasons, so from spring through fall. Uh, there are certain bee species that are uh, 
active that whole season and then others that are active for only a short period. This is a big important area for breeding butterfly monarchs, but also for migrating monarchs. And so we need to have, be sure there are plants blooming when the my, monarchs are migrating through. The Iowa Monarch Conservation Consortium is working on ways to collaborate with the agriculture community on common goals in rural landscapes. There are even grants and farm bill programs that can help farmers get involved. We're working hard in the state of Iowa to advance our nutrient reduction strategy. And so there's an increase in the amount of farmers putting in bioreactors and saturated buffers. And so one of the efforts of the consortium is how to link up these different activities. So instead of just putting grass on top of a bioreactor, let's put monarch habitat on top of that bioreactor so we can improve water quality and grow monarchs at the same time on the same footprint. And those flowering plants that we're picking, we're picking them to also be sure that they're attractive to native bees. During the peak of monarch migration, which is usually mid-September in Iowa, several groups help tag monarchs for research. Volunteers catch the butterflies and attach a small sticker with information on it. And hopefully this little girl will be found in Mexico and we can track the migration and know that she came from Blank Park Zoo. We let her go. It's going to take empowering school children and a, a change in mindset about what a garden is for. It's not just for humans to think something is beautiful. It is habitat for, for animals. And a successful pollinator garden is a garden um, that the leaves will be chewed up, there'll be larvae present, um, there'll be predators present, there'll be this whole ecosystem. So is there something everybody can do to pitch in, and it really is an all hands on, on deck. We know agricultural acres, landscape's gonna be really important, but even everything, we did everything in agricultural land, it won't be enough. We need everybody pitching in, and it's kind of fun because it draws everybody together in the state you know, with the same, same goal. And I feel that pollinator decline and monarch decline is kind of like what happened with the bald eagle. We saw that something was wrong, and we needed to fix it, or we were gonna lose this charismatic animal. We made the right decision, and now we have bald eagles. I think that's gonna happen in the case of the monarch, too. Over the past two decades, the number of outdoor trails in Iowa has expanded exponentially. From walking, hiking, biking, and even designated water trails, Iowa communities have invested heavily in these opportunities. One organization has digitized this experience to help you find and navigate the trails that crisscross Iowa. And the resource is likely already in the palm of your hand. The Iowa Natural Heritage Foundation has played a key role in developing Iowa's extensive trail system for the past 30 years. They refer to Iowa as the world capital of trails. Trails provide such a great opportunity to get people outside, um, to connect them to these natural areas, and to really have them understand the value of the connection between trails and natural areas and quality of life. I think that connectivity is definitely the key driver to a lot of the trail projects that we're seeing done today. People want to go somewhere, but in the same sense, they also want to have a good experience as they're going there. To help trail users navigate their way around, the Iowa Natural Heritage Foundation maintains a mobile app called Iowa by Trail. It features interactive trail maps for all of Iowa's multi-use trails. It tells you what activities the trail will accommodate. The app will geolocate you and follow you along the trail. It highlights points of interest you'll pass along the way, like natural resources, parks, historic sites, and restaurants. It has a ride calculator to track your speed and distance. And the app even provides weather information for the trail so you can plan ahead. I think our trail system's in great shape. Uh, there, are, We continue to expand it and grow it. If I could add anything other than the need for um, sustainable maintenance, it would be additional funding. There are so many different opportunities out there that exist right now to build trails. A big goal that we have with the app is extending beyond the multi-use trail system, so incorporating um, those hiking trails, those mountain biking trails, and eventually the water trails in Iowa, um, really getting people to see the full picture of the trail experience throughout the state. Just like the trail system, 
the app is ever evolving. So download it and let it help you explore and get to know Iowa by trail. While the Iowa by Trail app is a handy tool out and about our state, the talented production team here at IPTV is bringing you a new video resource this season. It's called IPTV's Trail in a Minute, where we'll show you a first-person view of a different Iowa hiking, biking, or water trail each episode. It's a great opportunity to relive a previous outdoor experience or to plan a future adventure. And it's a pretty cool way to view the Iowa outdoors. For avid cyclists, few municipal trails are as nice as the Trout Run Trail in Decorah. Whether you're visiting Northeast Iowa for fishing, camping, hiking, or biking, this 11 mile loop provides a perfect sampling of Decorah and its wonderfully distinct setting. Surrounded by rolling hills and steep bluffs, the trail's name comes from its five trout string crossings and its swing by the famous Decorah fish hatchery. With moderate inclines and a multitude of switchbacks, cyclists of every skill level can enjoy this trail. Of course, if you're looking for something truly unique, you'll definitely want a first-hand look at the cut, a section of the trail blasted open to offer an experience you won't find anywhere else. After the cut, you're just a short distance from town, a perfect excuse for a break from cycling to stop into a local shop, art gallery, or restaurant. The Trout Run Trail in Decorah, definitely somewhere you'll want more than a minute to enjoy. That wraps up this first episode of our seventh season of Iowa Outdoors. We encourage you to get outside and explore Iowa's parks and recreational opportunities. If you're planning any outdoor travel, check out our extensive video archive of adventures at iptv.org slash Iowa Outdoors. Our latest season of Iowa Outdoors will bring you more episodes than ever before with extra stories from every corner of our state. We'll leave you now with some more images of Iowa's outdoor environments. Funding for Iowa Outdoors is provided by the Claude P. Small, Catherine Small Cousins, and William Carl Cousins Fund at the Lincoln Way Community Foundation in Clinton County to support nature programming on Iowa Public Television. And by the Alliant Energy Foundation. Many of Iowa's natural wonders you'll find on Iowa Public Television can be found in Iowa Outdoors Magazine, the Iowa DNR's premier resource for conservation, education, and recreation activities. Subscription information can be found online at iowadnr.gov.